when God releases His power in his, into your life, you receive this grace. And because of grace, getting people saved. Because grace is the only thing that's going to save this nation. Hallelujah. Come with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We looked at this briefly last time. I wanted to unpack it, but I want to now bring revelation through from what we had a look at. We saw Paul talking about the thorn in his flesh. Now, so here we go, verse 7. Lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me by who? A messenger of who? Not God. God was not the one trying to keep Paul humble. It was a messenger of Satan. Why? To stop him being exalted above measure. Now we know that Peter says God wants to exalt you in due time. So God needs for you to be exalted, to be a voice of his gospel. Satan wants to stop you. And so this messenger was given to buffet him. In response, Paul Verse 8, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And God said to me, what? My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me, Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So this was not God saying, no, I want you to learn something. Paul saying, take this thing from me. God says, if you read it in context of all the other scriptures, you submit to God, resist the devil, he flees. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. So the authority lies in the believer. But once you step into that authority, God says, that's where you'll find my grace. So if you're trying to get rid of this flesh on your own, no, I wish the devil would stop and I can't take this anymore. I can't understand why he's always attacking me. Oh God, God, you see I'm in trouble. Then we're not accessing grace. It's when you say, God, I trust you. That's why Paul says that he rejoices in his infirmities, not for his infirmities. not saying, oh, well, then let, I must try and be as poor as possible, try and struggle as much as possible. He's not saying, I'm excited that another attack's coming. No, while he's in the attack, he rejoices. Why? Because whatever the devil tries to bring against me, it cannot override grace. So I rejoice. It's like, shoot your biggest shot, sucker. Go for it. Try what you like. Because when you understand that, then you are trusting, truly trusting grace. And that's when Paul saw that in that moment when he was at his weakness, he saw the greatest of grace manifesting. Hallelujah. And in that grace, he found was the strength of God. Have a look there in verse 9. My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength. My grace, my strength. My grace, my strength. When you understand the grace of God, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm not trying to be strong on my bond. It's like sometimes I stand in faith and, and people see that and say, but, but that's you, Pastor Allen. You, you're strong. No, I'm not. When you see me standing strong, it's not because I'm really disciplined and I'm the strong. I've got my mind sorted out. No, I just as much as anybody else realized without God, I would have been nothing. I would have been just as much in fear as anybody else. In fact, I, 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 I was a class one warrior W-O-R-R-I-O-R. -R -R. As in worry. I was a class one warrior before I was saved. But by His grace, there's strength. Someone says, nothing ever seems to faze you. It's His grace. His grace 
is my strength. Amen. 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 So, when you say, I'm so weak, I can't keep going on, that's exactly when you need to step into that throne. Yeah. So it's no longer I who lives, oh, yeah. it's Christ. Yeah. The one who is full of grace and truth. He lives in me. Oh, yeah. And I can do this because His grace strengthens me. Yeah. Hallelujah. So can you see how Christ and grace you can use interchangeably? Christ and grace, the anointing and grace, it's the same person. When you talk about grace, you're talking about the anointing. Come with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. Any married couples here? Let me see your hands. Anyone about to get married? Can I see your hands? Anybody want to get married in the future? Let me see your hand. All right. So we covered everybody tonight. All right. So let's look at it from that perspective. <laughs> 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 7. Husbands. Wife, bump your husband. Make sure he's awake right now. He needs to hear this. <laughs> Dwell with your wife with understanding. Giving Honor to your wife as to the weaker vessel. Now, it did not say she is the weaker vessel. I, I, I have a beautiful wife, Janine. And I have watched her giving birth to our children. Don't ever tell me a woman is weak. I thank God I was born male. How many of you ladies know what I'm talking about? Praise God. Amen. Amen. I was taught this is how you breathe. I tried to teach her. In the moment of birth, she was going through. I said, honey, you need to be. Oh, she <laughs> Hand on face. Literally. <laughs> I can do this. And I watched a woman with strength beyond anything I would ever been able to. So, don't ever get the idea, woman or we. That's also this whole feminism thing where women are trying to be, you know, equal to men. You are not equal in that sense because you're not male. You've been created as a female to carry that, that which God has gifted you for. And it does not make you inferior. And men don't ever see women as inferior on that basis. Amen. Amen. So when, we, when you look at the way God created, He knew what He was doing. When He made males male and He made females female, there's a plan in that, an eternal plan. And it's a function. It's not about who you are. It's a function. It's, it's, it's part of the gifting, what God's called you to do. And so when you see a woman, when, you see, when He talks about as a weaker vessel, that's when it comes to respect and honor. The way I like to look at it is like you treat fine china. How many of you know you don't bang fine china around like you do a tin plate? So you don't abuse and throw around and, and mishandle. No, respect, honor. The greatest revelation I got one day, I was having a situation with, with, with Janine. And I was talking to God about it, and I was trying to sort it out, and like, you know. And then he said, that's my daughter you're talking about. I snapped her attention. I said, yes, sir. Because she's first his daughter before she's my wife. Amen. And when I see her as his daughter, I respect and honor her. I respect and honor her. That's what he's talking about here. And so... He says here, honor your wife as the weaker vessel. Why? You are heirs together of the grace of life. You are heirs together. I like where the Message Bible says, in the new life of God's grace, you're equals. You see, under the old way of understanding that became the religion is Men saw themselves as superior to women. That wasn't God. 
That was read into religion. How many understand that, that God gave his word and even Jesus said to the Jewish people, your traditions made my word null and void. So they were not living, even though they had the old covenant, they had interpreted the laws through the eyes of man. And through that had developed this slave mentality, developed the abuse of woman. And now we understand by grace, there's neither male nor female. So in, when you get to heaven, there's not going to be male and female. We are all spirit beings created in the image of God. So when I'm in this suit that I'm in on the earth, it's male because my calling requires for me to be a male. Janine's calling requires for her to be a female. And together we produce children. Now that, would, that child would never have been born if it wasn't for the male and for the female. Now you can understand why God says it's important that a relationship is male and female. Anything else distracts from where God's taking it. So now I can be a father and bring aspects to the family that only I can bring. And Janine brings aspects to the family that only she can bring. And together raise a family and children and also in the kingdom of God, in the house here. So, where there's neither male nor female in the kingdom of God, we are both heirs of Christ. Not just the male. We are both heirs. And as co-heirs, when you recognize that and come together that way, then he says, yeah, listen to this. Now, he's talking specifically to husbands because they are the ones under religion have not walked this way. Now, because of grace, he says, treat your wife with honor Understanding this grace, why? That your prayers may not be hindered. That your prayers may not be hindered. Uh, hello? How many want your prayers answered? Are there things that can stop prayers from being answered? Because God says, whenever you pray, I'll hear you. And if I hear you, I'll answer you. So there must be something that's stopping him from hearing. So, because if he hears, he will answer. So if your prayers are not being answered, analyze your life. And in a marriage, he has one of them. Guys, husbands, if you've been praying and you're wondering why your prayer is not answered, check out how you're treating God's daughter. Because if we're not treating his daughter right, he says, you can speak away, I'm not even going to listen. And you don't treat her lovely because she's lovely. You treat her lovely because God said so. Amen. What happens? It opens the windows of heaven. Amen. Just as much as your tithe opens the windows, so does respecting his daughter. And when you understand that you treat women right, men, then women don't abuse that. I didn't hear the big amen there. <laughs> so you... You don't take it for granted and take it, you know, and disrespect and, and use that now to work your way. That's all another message. <laughs> but what I am saying, when you do that, what happens? Grace shows up. Grace shows up. Notice what he says here. This is what I want you to see. Let's read it again, then you'll see it in context. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. What happens when your prayers are not hindered? You'll see results. Those results are the manifestation of the grace of life. So the grace of life is talking about the benefits of life. So when you understand that, grace, when grace shows up, you're going to see a manifestation. You're going to see something coming out of it. You're going to see a reflection. You're going to see a benefit. Everybody say benefit. benefit. Hallelujah. And let's go to Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 6. 
that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ. How? Through the gospel. Now, you know, unto this point, before Jesus died, it was only the Jews who had the old covenant. Then, once Jesus died and rose from the dead, God revealed to Peter that this message was for Gentiles also. It's for the whole world, whoever believes. Now, the entire covenant of God is available to all, including Gentiles. Gentiles were those who did not have the old covenant through God. You and I are born again, and now we have access to that. And that's who he's talking about here. Now the Gentiles are fellow heirs, the same body, partakers of the same promise. Verse 7, of which I became a minister, listen to this, according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of His power. Amen. By the effective working of His power. Now notice this. Paul says he's a minister. He could preach to Gentiles. How? Because of the gift of the grace of God. Now how was that grace given to him? By the effective working of His power. So grace is a manifestation of that power. When God releases His power in his, into your life, you receive this grace. And because of grace, remember Paul said himself, he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was well studied in the law. He knew exactly what the covenant was. And according to that covenant, Israel was God's chosen people. He was raised in that, which literally... In terms of the old covenant, this wasn't God's intention, but because of the carnality of man, and because man was fallen, he hadn't yet been saved, it developed into racism. And so in terms of racism, even the Samaritans were rejected. They were considered scum by Jewish people. So you take a hardened racist who, even when Christians were trying to spread the gospel, went out and had Christians executed. And he carried letters of execution and was present watching Stephen getting stoned and delivered into heaven. And Stephen saw the glory of God. And Paul was a young man standing there holding the clothes, watching this man. And he, was, he carried many letters of execution to make sure that happened. And so when God turned him... He now didn't just reach Jews and preach the gospel. He went to the very ones that were considered the outcasts and the downtrodden. And he preached the gospel to the Gentiles. And that for himself, he realized, I would never have been able to do that if it wasn't for grace. Grace washed out all that racism. Grace washed out all that prejudice. Grace washed out all the old things he learned under the law. And he had to now receive the revelation of love and of grace and of faith. And he wrote almost two-thirds of the New Testament that we today, as the church who knows God is love, that we walking in that aspects of grace, Paul says, I would never have been able to do these things, but by His grace, because of His power. Family, the salvation of this nation of South Africa and any other nation in the world, but particularly the nation we live in, the salvation of this country is not getting the right government into office. It's getting the right person. People that understand grace. Getting people saved. Because grace is the only thing that's going to save this nation. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Because when I look at you, whoever you are, when I look at you, I don't want to see you as male or female. I don't want to see you by the color of your skin. I want to look at you by your status in life, what your wealth is, where you live. When I look at you, I want to, by grace, look through all of that and see the person God loves and died for and rose from the dead and put aside all prejudices and be able to minister you without judgment or condemnation, but with love that will draw you to the presence of God. And that's 
that's what each and every one of us need to be doing as believers. And if the church got a hold of that, we will take a hold of this nation and turn it to the glory of God. Isn't this a great message? Now my dad has something he would like to share with you on how grace can empower you in your partnership. Please enjoy. That has been a powerful, powerful time in the Word of God. God is our great, bountiful God of grace. That grace, whatever you need grace for, whether it's grace to be a father, grace to be a mother, grace to be a parent in the ministry, like right now I'm operating in a grace. There's so many different aspects to God's grace. And I want to have access to every form of the grace that is available for my life, that I can succeed in every arena of my life. Now, how does that happen? Look at verse 8. God is able to make all grace. See, that's every grace that you have need of. Make all grace abound toward you that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. Now that is a lot of alls and always and everys. And that, when you think about it, that, that's all sufficiency in everything. Imagine your house is paid for in full. Your car is paid for in full, full of petrol. Your groceries are bought. Uh, all the clothing you need is bought. And then you get your salary at the end of the month. Now, what are you supposed to do with that? Well, there's the excess. There's the abundance for that every good work. You can be a generous person to see the work of God getting preached. Now, is that possible? Yes, it is from the scripture. Now, God is able to make this grace abound towards you. And it's not just finances. This is in the area that when you speak to someone, they're blessed, they're encouraged. When I lay hands on someone, they're healed. This is anything that I need in life is available for me. Now, you notice it starts with the word and, and God is able to make all grace. Well, where does this begin with? It begins with verse 6. Thus I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. We're talking about an abundant harvest. Now, how does that happen? Let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly of necessity. God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound towards us. That's why I've said it so often before. Grace flows in the atmosphere of generosity. You see, once I begin with generosity, grace will manifest in every other area of my life. That's why we encourage our partners, as you sow seed into this ministry, number one, you're making sure that others get to hear the Word of God. People are getting saved because of your gift. But number two is there is an abundant grace flowing in your life. You're activating that flow of grace and you will see the harvest coming back to you. And that's what I believe. Every seed sown into this ministry causes great increase and abundance of flow of God's grace in your life as well. And I'm going to stand in agreement with that right now. Let's pray together. If you're giving today, there are the details on the screen. You can go to our website and let's agree together. Father, thank you. As my friend sows into this ministry today, I call on the promise of your word that your grace abounds in their lives, that they always have all sufficiency in all things and abundance for every good work. My God, you supply all of their need and we praise you for it. Let the harvest come now in the name of Jesus, that you would continue to increase and multiply and let their seed of abundance produce that bountiful harvest in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, I believe that is done and it's on its way to you right now. So I encourage you, trust God's grace and partner with us today and be part of the great things that God is doing. Allen Bag Ministries is coming to your area. If you're in the Durban area, Allen Bag will be ministering at Christian Revival Church in Durban this weekend, the ministry of Glenn and Alison Schroeder. For any information relating to these events, please contact us or visit us online at allenbagministries.org. As born-again children of God, 
we have been made the righteousness of God. And by faith, we have access to God's grace. Whatever you're doing, whatever your call is, whatever vision is in your heart, grace enables you to fulfill that. In this life-changing series, Alan Bagg will teach you the relationship between righteousness and God's grace. You're going to see God in a whole new light, and it's going to really make your walk with Him even more powerful. Learn to triumph over any obstacle in your life. When you see grace the way God intended for you to see it, and you walk in it, you're going to see yourself reigning in life. Understanding and operating in the fullness of God's grace has the potential to make us unstoppable. So get the series and walk in the fullness of God's grace. Contact Allen Bank Ministries at any of these details. Praise God, how encouraging is it to know that it is by grace through faith that we are saved, not by works so that any man should boast. It is only by the grace of God that we can stand here today and know that I have been saved. I am born again because of what Jesus did for me. If that's you and you are saying, I want to give my life to Jesus today, pray this prayer out loud with me. Thank you, Jesus, that you died and you rose again from the dead. Today, I choose you. Thank you for dying and rising again from the dead. And today you are alive and I invite you into my heart. I make you my Lord and my Savior. And one day I will see you face to face. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen, congratulations, you are now born again. But you may have many questions. How do I now go on this next journey, on this next walk? What are my next steps? And here at Allen Bag Ministries, we would like to get something into your hands that will help you build your faith and help you in your walk with God. So what you can do is go to our website at allenbagministries.org and click the Start Your Journey tab and there will be great reading material for you to start this new journey with God. Now this particular series, I want to encourage you to go get this for yourself, to listen to it over and over every day so that it can really be part of your spirit. It's not just grace through faith that we are saved, it's by grace that we can do so much other things that God has prepared for us. It's only by His grace. So I want to encourage you, go and get this series for yourself to learn this message of grace so that it becomes a part of you. You renew your mind and you can live by grace through faith. You can go to allenbagministries.org to get hold of it for yourself. Well, that's it for today. Thank you so much for joining us on Wisdom for Life. My name is Joshua Bagg and remember, Jesus is Lord and life is a choice. Choose life. Mm -hmm.